God doesn't cover up his people's sins, especially in the Old Testament. Rather, he exposes them so that they might repent. And so that those who see the sin and the consequences might exercise wisdom and avoid the same follies. You see, he also exposes them to bring glory to his name. Because where sin increases, grace abounds. So, you know, if you do something stupid in your life, and you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, I repent from this, he's saying, my grace is going to abound to you. This is all my righteousness. No. White as snow, no other fountain, no, it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Thus Jephthah was driven away, not only from his father's house, but he was driven away from his entire homeland. So Jephthah was a child of shame. He was denied any inheritance. He was kicked out of his home. He was separated from family and from countrymen. And what was interesting was other roughnecks heard about him and they found out where he was, and they kind of moseyed out into the wilderness to hang out with him. And kind of a gang developed. Well, Jephthah was tough, and he was courageous, and he always had to fight to survive, but now he's living in the wilds, and this gives him a new toughness, a shell of hardness that kept other people at a distance, even his own men had to manage through the tough reserve of Jephthah. Well, as time passed, Jephthah developed a reputation for being quite a leader. He was the leader of the gang. He was the man in charge. His military exploits caught the attention of the Israelites, especially the Gileads. And soon, the very people who had rejected Jephthah and treated him worse than scum, came crawling back to him and begged him, come and help us defeat the Ammonite oppressors. So looking at verse 6, it says, Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. I love Jephthah's response. Didn't you hate me? And drive me away from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Well, they had pretty much pleaded, please, please, please come and help us. Please be our captain. The Ammonite oppression is unbearable. They have destroyed our towns. Please can you come and help us? Well, Jephthah sought the Lord. To make the story short, Jephthah, in seeking the Lord's assistance, says this in verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mista, uh, Mispah of Gilead. Verse 32 says, Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. So Jephthah went from being a zero in the eyes of his family 
and his people to being a hero. And he became their leader for the next six years. But let me talk to you about the man of Jephthah. Jephthah, and I'm going to your notes, filling in the blanks of your notes now. Jephthah was a man of faith. He says, suppose the Lord gives me victory. Of course, once you have confessed the name of the Lord as the one who guides our steps, we'd better make sure that the Lord is guiding our steps. Don't say the Lord is guiding me and then we're doing our own thing. We better make sure that he is the one that's in control And when our goal has been accomplished, we need to make sure that God gets the glory for that. If we invoke the name of the Lord for help, we'd better be seeking His will. And if we use His name in an oath, we better fulfill it. One of the commonly, uh, uh, one of the things among men and women remembered in the Bible was their faith that they didn't take it lightly when they used the Lord and his name. It would behoove us all today as Christians to remember this and to pay attention to this. And how often do we hear from one another such expressions as, Oh, God, help me. Or, Oh, my God. Or for those of you who don't like to type it all out, OMG. Oh, Lord! And so on. Or how about, God told me to, when we really didn't hear from him. It's something that we really wanted to do. But let's blame God for it instead. We've got to be aware that just, just because we're not uttering profanities with the Lord's name, that we still could be blaspheming his name no less in our carelessness as we use his name. And that's one of the things that Jephthah didn't do. Jephthah was a man of faith. He was a man of wisdom. Next characteristic we can see displayed in Jephthah was that of patience. Rather than jumping on his horse and riding off with an army to go fight the Ammonites, he sends messages to them, trying to reason with them. And the whole thing is contained in verses 12 through 28, and it's really more than what I want to accomplish here this morning. But what he does is, in that place, he gives a history lesson of where Israel was and where they came from and what happened and how they are where they're at today. So, the excuse that the Ammonites are using to attack Israel is that the Israelites took away their land. Have you ever heard that before over in the Middle East? So, when they came out of Egypt, they said, you guys took our land and we want it back. Now, this has been over 300 years ago. And Jephthah said that Israel didn't take the land from anyone. It was won in battle. And it was a battle that Israel didn't start. Well, of course, the king of the sons of Ammon, they disregarded the message and the fight was on. Verse 29, I've already read it to you. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon a yielded vessel, that's someone willing to give their life over to the Lord... God's will is done, and God is glorified. So verse 32 says, So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. So he was a man of faith. He was a man of wisdom. And now the third thing is he was a man in need of grace. You see, in the New Testament where Old Testament saints are mentioned, their faults are not dredged back up. Only their faith is on display. 
I mean, when you read the faith chapter and there's uh, all these names and we've, we talked about Barak uh, and we're talking about Jephthah, what does it say? It says, they were men of faith except for? No. It says, these are men of faith. Their past isn't dredged up. But in the Old Testament, nothing's held back. We're told exactly what their lives were like. See, we can read the failures of Moses and Abraham. We can read the failures of Jacob and David and all the others. And we can be encouraged that God uses real people and real situations, real faults, real problems. They're right there. And these people were no different than you and I. You know, we, we take a look at their lives and we think, oh God, why don't you speak to me like that? First of all, how do you know how God spoke to them? We just know that God spoke to them somehow. Was it in their mind? Was it uh, a gut feeling? Was it a, I don't know if there was a whole lot of audible voices. Maybe, I don't, but I'm thinking there wasn't a whole lot of audible voices as God spoke. But we know that Jephthah knew that God gave him the victory. So here we are with Jephthah. He only remembers and records, uh, is recorded in the New Testament, his faith. And we can encourage that the views of us are also looked through the same lens of grace. That God doesn't hash up our faults in the old way of life or what happened yesterday how many here has ever heard god say remember what you did yesterday no he doesn't do that we might do that satan might try to do that but god would never do that so here we are with jephthah his faith in the lord and his subsequent victory he has won by the lord's anointing are not diminished by his folly They are only more clearly demonstrated by the fact that the event in the shadow of this foolish vow that he makes, and I haven't told you about that yet, that God still uses the man for his purpose and for his victory. So let's take a look at this vow that Jephthah made. And there is some sense of difficulty with this passage and some application for ourselves in fact we just read this in devotions not too long ago and and one of the things we talked about was why did God even put this in here I I don't understand why it's there and maybe that's one of the reasons I'm talking about him today because I'm kind of intrigued by the whole episode of what happened so let me just share it with you maybe some of you already know but maybe some of you are in the dark about this In verse 30, it says, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's. And I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Now, I don't know if Jephthah had a dog and he thought maybe someone would open the door when he's coming back to town and say go get him Rover I don't know but the first folly here that Jephthah has is making a deal with God I mean we can glance back at verse 9 and remind ourselves that Jephthah had already given the Lord advanced credit for the victory. He'd already said the victory will be God's. And remember that Jephthah had just given the king of the Ammonites a history lesson on Israel coming out of Egypt and how they got the land to start with. So he already knows that the odds don't shake God up. He already knows that God is God and God is victorious and he's given God all the credit. I mean, just 95 years earlier, Gideon 
And since Jephthah knew the history of Israel, I'm sure that he knew about Gideon. Gideon defeats an army of over 100,000 people with 300 men blowing a trumpet and holding a candle as they run down the hill. Nevertheless, Mr. I want to see everything in writing, Jephthah says, if you give the Ammonites into my hands, I will do such and such. Listen, believers, it is an insult to God who has provided you with eternal salvation and an assured home in heaven to presume to cut a deal with him about some petty endeavor in this life. When I was putting this together, my mind went to an episode of MASH. Father Mulcahy was making his rounds to the beds in the recovery room. And one soldier says, Father, come here. He says, Father, I've got a problem. He says, I was in the foxhole, and they were coming at us from all directions. And I said to God, God, if I get out of this thing alive, I will become a priest and I will serve you forever. And Father Mulcahy's response, and it's stuck with me ever since because it is the worst possible response a man who is a man of God could give is God understands it's okay you don't have to be a priest. God is into commitments, friends. I want you to know that if you make a commitment Stick to it because God is into commitments. All right, well, it's a demonstration of faithlessness when we cast doubts on his desire to see us through a trial and bring glory to his own name by causing us to triumph in him by saying, if you will do such and such. It is arrogant presumption to offer for his help something we should be giving him anyhow. You know, it's like, Lord, I'm going on this job interview. If you will help me get this job, I will tithe and give offerings to missions and help the poor if... I think the Lord would say something like, haven't you been doing that all along? Isn't that what you were supposed to be doing whether you had this job or not? Isn't that a New Testament truth? Or, oh Lord, if you will help me or my loved one win this battle with this disease or this illness, I will strive to serve you better in the church and in my life. And maybe the Lord would ask, how might you be serving me in the church and in your life even now in the midst of your trial? Isn't this something we should be doing already? Nowhere in the Bible is there an abomination to give your life to the Lord and to the church in service only when everything is going right and only when the Lord has delivered you from your trials. Jephthah shouldn't have offered God any frivolous vows in exchange for his help. He'd already got assurance God was going to help him. You see, if you're going to offer God worship and sacrifice to the Lord, just do it from a worshiping heart. And it will be accepted by Him. Do it, even if His help doesn't seem like it's forthcoming. Because He is God. He is God. Here's what Job says. 
Job says, though he slay me, I will hope in him. But here's a verse I want you to know. I want you to see it, and I want you to read it as I read it. You don't have to read it out loud. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 23. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, it says that no vow is required. But if you make a vow, keep it. Look at it with me. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, don't be slow to pay it. For the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. You know what he's saying here? If you just keep your mouth shut, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. It says, but if you refrain from, uh, let me go to 23. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do. Because you made your vow freely to the Lord your God with your own mouth. Okay. So that was folly number one. He made a vow to God. And he didn't have to. Number two was, in his vow, he boasted by being specific and by making a promise. If he would have stopped to give it any thought, he might have realized he was potentially putting himself in a tight spot. Look at verse 34. It says, When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter. And then he goes on to say, I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. Now, you can go through the commentaries, and you can read what the commentators are saying, and there are a wide range of arguments for the various stands on where the commentator might be. But as far as I can see, the Bible says Jephthah made a vow to offer in burnt offering the first thing he saw coming out of his house after the victory. And then in verse 39 it says that after her mourning period, he gave her time to mourn and be with her friends and all this kind of stuff. He did to her according to the vow which he made. That means he offered her as a burnt offering. Now the question is, does it make it right? Absolutely not. Not in the least. God doesn't go for killing our children on an altar or for any other reason. But on the other hand, God is serious about vows that we make. So how do we get something of value from this lesson today? What can we learn from this? Well, first, I think by not letting ourselves get so focused on the difficulty of the vow question and the shocking thought of a man offering his daughter as a burnt offering that we miss the whole point of the Scripture. Because God has put this in here for a reason, and the reason isn't that we kill our kids or make stupid choices. No, remember I said that the Bible is absolutely honest. One time I, I preached a message on there's lies in the Bible. Oh, man, some people got upset with me before the... It was a Sunday night message, and I, I announced what I was going to preach on Sunday morning, and people come up to me, the, there are no lies in the Bible. The Bible tells the truth. I said, you're exactly right. The Bible does tell the truth. But... When Satan tells Jesus to jump off the temple and land on the ground and he let him rule the earth, that's a lie. 
That's a lie. Because Jesus would have jumped off the temple and landed on the ground and splat. He'd have been gone. So there are lies in the Bible. There are untruths in the Bible. There are stupidity things in the Bible. But it's the truth of what happened. And that's what we have here. The truth of what happened. The Bible is telling us the honest event. God doesn't cover up his people's sins, especially in the Old Testament. Rather, he exposes them so that they might repent. And so that those who see the sin and the consequences might exercise wisdom and avoid the same follies. You see, he also exposes them to bring glory to his name. Because where sin increases, grace abounds. So, you know, if you do something stupid in your life and you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, I repent from this, he's saying, my grace is going to abound to you. So, here in our text today, we're given the picture of a man who is no different than us. A man who believes in the one true God, yet is capable of the most heinous of acts. And... We are, even as believers, capable of the same abominations. And if you think that you're not, you're setting yourself up for a fall, friends. Jephthah is a man who knows the history of God's people. He's also uh, the history and also the history of God's miraculous help throughout. And yet his doubts, his place of needing assurances, he is tripped up over those things in his tendency to not walk by faith, but to walk by sight. We are, even as the New Testament believers, prone to fall and faults like this. And if you think not, you are deceiving yourself. You see, Jephthah was a rebel without cause. He wanted assurances. He wanted to argue his case. He wanted to make deals that would assure his success. And he didn't have to because God had already told him he was going to be successful. And I'm telling you here this morning, standing upon the word of God, you are going to be successful. And God will move in your life. And God will open doors for you. And you don't have to make any deals with God. He doesn't want your deal. He wants you to worship him and he wants you to fall before him through your trials and through your victories. You see, Jephthah was a man of God, chose to be mentioned in the New Testament as one of those by faith. And even though Jephthah had this horrible, dreadful thing that he did in his life, here's what it says at the end of that verse that I started to read at the very beginning. They conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. And while you and I are made of the same stuff as Jephthah, and equally capable of folly and error and insecurity and doubts. We serve the same God as Jephthah, who glorifies his name through the yielded vessel. He helps us in times of trouble. He grants approval of our lives through faith. He justifies the sinner and because he accepts us through the atoning work of his son he grants to us his righteousness he never again mentions our faults again never again